um, so the understanding the sensitization process. Um, we will be running Nuno and myself this uh, first presentation this morning, which will take uh, up to the lunch time. Of course, for some of you, maybe there are some very initial basics that we will repeat, but uh, yes, this is a, a training session, so we, we wish to cover and to put up to date all the all the, the interested uh, attendees. So we can uh, run directly, and, and I have to inform you that it will be the topic will be more and more difficult with the time, and tomorrow also you will have much more uh, uh, detailed um, refinement of what we are presenting today. But uh, let's start with some simple things. So the content of this first session will be the responsibilities of BTTC and working group, uh, explanation of the process from new work item to publication. And we will give some, let's say, background information that you can find on the BOSS and on any other useful information. A set of acronyms that we are usually using, and we are using a lot of acronyms in this environment, as you know. I suppose you you know all about the BT, which is a technical board, which, which is the, the management body of of the of the SEN, and we have also a technical board for SENELEC. CCMC is us, it is the, the area, the management center, plus the staff, of course. CIB is a committee internal balloting, so it is a kind of it's a, a tool to vote upon a specific decision. Technical committee, working group. Uh, I suppose you you will discover what it is if you do not know yet. New work item is uh, an NWI. Preliminary work item we will explain also la later. And NSB in the context of SAN is a national sensation bodies. So we start first directly with the first layer. There are three layers in the development of the standard. And the, the first, the top layer is the technical board, which is the management body, where the uh, technical representative of each of an NSBs are meeting. And this is really the, the management organized uh, body managing all the technical activities um, which will be uh, developed under either the technical committees or the BT working groups. Those are structures that the BT creates in order to develop a series of documents. But again, those technical committees themselves will not really uh, develop uh, documents. They will um, attribute it to working groups. The working group will be a part of the scope of the technical committee and will be in charge of developing documents. So first element, the technical board. The technical board is composed by the chairperson who is uh, on a routine basis, uh, every three years there is a, a new, a new uh, vice president technical and for the moment is uh, Anika Andreasen from SIS. The secretariat, I think you you had the possibility to meet her a few minutes ago. She is uh, Cynthia Missiroli, who is the, the director of our department and also the, um, holding the secretariat of the, of the technical board. The membership are, as I said already, the members, one per country of the, the, the 34 NSBs. And we have also a series of observers, which are the what we call the societal organization, like ANEC, ECOS, SBS, ETUC, um, and also, of course, the European, some European partners that are organization having a, a big interest in the support of several TCs in the organization and the, and the European Commission. Usually, the technical board is will take the decision by correspondence. So every week, you get uh, or your BT member uh, get a, a set of decision to be um, to be approved. And these two decisions normally 
they have four weeks to reply to to them, and uh, and this allows to to progress the decision and the, the development of the organization. But of course, there are also meetings, face to face meetings. There are two uh, main plenary meetings, uh, what we call the SANBT meetings, which happen twice a year. But in the meantime, in order to resolve, let's say, issues that were uh, raised during the decision by correspondence, there are meetings of the what we call the SANBT uh, TCMG. So it is a, the management of the TC. So it is a substructure of the BT, which is there to resolve the problem between uh, two main sessions. So the, the responsibilities of the BTs is to advise and decide on technical matters, that, of course, at higher level, related to organization, procedure, coordination, overlap, and planning. It examined and decide on new projects. Basically, we will see later that it will not supervise the creation of new work items because it is delegated to the TC, but it is the body which will create the technical committee or BT working group as mentioned in the slide before. So it will undertake any task with regard technical work and which could be requested by higher structure, which are the General Assembly and Administrative Board. So as you understood, as the decisions are taken by correspondence, uh, most of the decisions are managed on a, on a daily basis without real intervention and discussion. And only when there are issues, uh, this is discussed in a in a plenary, and what we call management by exception. Management by exception is, in fact, delegating to the technical committees the management of their uh, little area, which is the scope of the TC, uh, which allow, um, let's say, possibility to focus only on, on problems at high level. The, the TCs, as you understood, are taking uh, decision which are called delegated decision. Those de delegated decisions are covering a broad range of uh, topics for decision, like appointment of the chairperson, approval of business plan, decision related to technical work on activation of preliminary work item, work package, etc. There are a lot of decisions which are delegated to the TC. And so the BT is just having a look. And if there is a problem, of course, the te technical board may react and be opposed to a decision taken by a technical committee. But it is happening very rarely. Uh, I had a case in 20 years. I don't know if you know that sub case, but there are not many uh, cases like that. However, nevertheless, we still have to some time to uh, to have decisions which are not um, delegated by the TC. And so when a decision is delegated to the TC, the TC run a CIB, a ballot, and at the end of the ballot, it is usually positive, or if not, we need to have a, a, another action. But if it is positive, the, the, the TC secretary is able, for example, to create the work item and things like that. If not, he may rely on our colleagues in CS CCMC, which are running the data department, and the outcome of the decision will be transferred into the database. But sometimes, as I said, the delegated decision uh, are not existing for some specific uh, topics. And here I put three examples. It's maybe not easy to read, but I will read for, for you. Uh, there was a case here on withdrawal of an EN. It's quite, quite of, not quite often, but it is regu regular that sometimes there are documents which are totally outdated, which are not replaced by a new edition, because when we have a, a new edition of a document, automatically, with a transition period, the older version will disappear. But it happens sometimes that, for example, an EN is... Uh, is withdrawn because it's not uh, uh, used anymore. And 
as you understand, as the documents is part of the national collection, it is important that the BT members are taking this decision. So it is a decision which is, um, the elements are provided by you, STC secretary, and we, with our teams here in, in the CCMC, we prepare this document, which is then uh, put in front of the BT. As I said, every every weeks we send a batch of decision upon which the uh, BT need, need to take a decision. And this is one of the case where the BT will take a decision. Another case uh, is the request of a second formal vote. You will see later that usually we have following the process, only one formal vote. But if it fails, we may decide, the TC may decide to ask for a second formal vote. And also, uh, the third example, you will see when you have the slide in front of you, uh, it is uh, related to the change of scope. As I explained, the BT will decide on the creation of, of the substructure of the TCs. So it is normal that when he has created uh, 300, 400 TCs, that if the TCs decide to change a little bit its scope, uh, it, it needs to be put on, on under the eyes of the of the CNBT because it could happen that uh, a TC is trying to take a room uh, which is already covered by another TC. But there are, it's only a, a set of examples. There are many other cases, and maybe later, if you have questions, we'll can ask if it is covered by a delegated decision or it, it is to be covered by a, a decision that we will manage directly with the BT. So now we come to the technical committee, which is the, the management body uh, developing the series of deliverable, the EN, the TS, the TR, and this will be explained later. As, as mentioned, the TCs are uh, established by the CNBT based on a very precise title and scope. Um, and the TCs are, let's say, the management body responsible for drafting the deliverables. The creation of a TC will be, of course, supported by, by CCMC. And during the lifetime, there is always a program manager supporting a specific TC. For each of the TC in the system, there is a program manager or an account manager uh, supporting the TC. And basically the main task of the TCs in the European context that we will develop later this afternoon is the timely execution of standardization requests, standardization requests being the act uh, given by the commission to send to develop a specific set of standards to support a specific legislation. So the TC, like anybody, uh, is composed of a chairperson, usually coming from the industry and appointed by the member holding the TC. There is a secretariat and then uh, or, or else by the uh, member holding the TC. And then uh, it is composed, of course, of national delegations like, like the BT, and we'll give more details about the composition of the TC in the, in the coming slide. And similarly, we have European partner liaison, sometime observer coming from the commission, etc. So the chairperson, as mentioned, is appointed by CNBT on proposal from the uh, secretariat uh, member. The decision is taken by the TC as a delegated decision. So the pair are, let's say, appointing, uh, voting for for the the chairperson, which is uh, of, which is uh, uh, proposed by the secretariat. By definition, the chairperson need to be neutral. He will preside meeting and manage the consensus. Uh, he may interface with CCMC on strategic decisions, specific issues, etc. And so, he it will he will uh, he or she will uh, ensure coordination an exchange of information with other TCs. So uh, here we have a little drawing about what is the consensus. So it is a, a general agreement based on an absence of a sustained opposition and which is representing the view of all the parties. 
so in order to to get those consensus we we have to uh, use conciliation and uh, balance concern interest the secretary is appointed by the same member is uh, all which has been given the responsibility of the technical committee technical committee uh, it ensure he or she ensure that uh, TC works efficiently and upon an agreed timetable. Uh, it, he or she prepares and distributes documents, agenda, documents for discussion, reports, decision, documents for creation of work item. So there are a lot of work, of course, for, for, for the secretariat to uh, support the TC. So the the management of document is a key, the key uh, duty of the secretariat and for that there is a, a, a document platform which is uh, based on for send on the ISO platform um, and of course the secretary has also to take a look on the CNBT decision in order to um, to see if there are BT decisions which may impact the, the TC. Some BT decisions are, are of a generic nature and will impact all the TCs because they are related on procedure and management of the technical structure. Others will be very dedicated to a specific TC. So the TC will ensure that there is coordination with other technical committees, liaise with CCMC, and of course, in case of sensation request, uh, he or she will be responsible for preparing report and we will speak later about what we mean by report in the context of sensation request. So we mentioned that a TC is composed of a series of uh, actors. So there are of course the, the same members who are usually allowed to come with three delegates. There are European partners, those are the, the big associations which are, uh, let's say, having a, an interest in following a series of technical committees. For example, in the field of machinery, there is an organization which is called Orgalime, which is, of course, interested by a broad range of TCs. But there are also what we call the social partners. Then, next to that, below, the European Liaison Organization are all the other uh, associations in Europe who have been uh, submitting uh, a request to send to get uh, a liaison status. And this is handled by a team. Uh, and at the end of the day, of course, the TC will decide if this uh, liaison organization is um, in the scope of the TC and will take a decision on its involvement. There are affiliates, so those are countries not belonging to the 34 countries, liaison officer from other TCs, European Commission, and possibly a delegation of ISO or IEC. The working group is the, let's say, the working structure. It is established by the technical committee. It has a, normally a short-term task, so prepare a set of documents or sometimes only one document. It is composed of ind individual experts. Those experts are appointed by the NSBs. There is a, a tool for the NSBs to register the experts and to link them to a specific working group. Of course, like any management team, it has to get a convener who is the leader of the working group and will lead the document the development of the document will decide when the document has reached a certain level of maturity and will apply the rules in terms of edition, in terms of practice within the, the technical, technical committee, and will report on a, at least yearly basis to the, the uh, parent technical committee. So, here you will, I will not enter into this, but uh, when you have the slide, you can get the code of conduct on the participation of sense and technical work. It is a code of conduct which uh, describes how to behave fairly in order to, let's say, uh, develop documents in a, in, a, in a good ambience. 
So I give the floor to my colleague who will continue. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Nuno Pargana, account manager in the manufacturing team. So this means that uh, I am the unit manager and I, I support a team of four sectoral PMs in the fields of construction, machinery, and chemicals. So this part of the presentation is to explain how the standards are developed from the moment that the work item is created until the moment that the document is published, that the standard is published. There are four types of SEND deliverables. We have European standards. We have the technical specification, so the TS. We have technical reports, and we have the SEND workshop agreements. So the focus of this presentation will be on European standards, which is our prime deliverable. And by the way, if you have questions, you can just interrupt and you can raise your hand and I'm happy to, to explain during the, the presentation. So you don't need to wait until the end. If you wish, you can uh, ask your question. So let's focus on European standards. And again, homegrown, this part of the presentation is on homegrown European standards. So standards that are developed by the SEN technical committees without the work in parallel with ISO under the Vienna Agreement. For that, there is a specific session in uh, the afternoon. So focus on just purely homegrown European standards. Here, what you can see is the different stages on how standards can be developed. So the first stage is that there must be a proposal that has to be assessed and then decided whether to go ahead with that proposal to draft a standard or not. The second stage is the drafting and consensus building. So the working group will draft the standards and of course the working group convener together with the experts, they need to ensure that uh, the, the draft uh, reach the consensus level to proceed to the next stage, which is the public inquiry. So this is a vote. After the closure of the inquiry, normally there is a stage called consideration of comments or handle, handling of comments. So the inquiry closes and then the document is back to the technical committee, in specific to the working group, to take on board the comments that was that were received during the inquiry. After that, the document is submitted to a formal vote and the stage is called approval of the standard. And if the vote is positive at formal vote stage, this means that the standard enters into a publication phase or finalization stage where the document is prepared for uh, being uh, published. So let's start with the first stage, which is uh, the proposal. So as I said, the proposal must be assessed. The proposal may come from anywhere, but of course, anywhere within the SEN system, so within the SEN community. Most of the times, the proposal to start working on a standard come from an existing technical committee, most of the times but it could come as well from the European Commission. So the Commission may request then to develop standards or even other deliverables in support of EU legislation or EU policy. It could come as well from a SEN member, so a national standardization body. In particular, when there is no, when a member would like to develop a standard and there is no structure, when there is no technical committee, it is possible that the member would make a proposal to develop, uh, to create, sorry, a new TC, and then that TC would be responsible to develop a specific standard or set of standards. And it could come as well from the SEN partner organization or liaison organization. So this is an added, <clears throat> the added value of becoming a partner or liaison with a TC is that they can bring proposals to the technical committee, even though they cannot vote on standards, but they can contribute to the drafting and they can also make proposals to develop new standards. So, as I said, the proposal must be submitted by one of these uh, actors. Uh, the proposal uh, needs to be assessed whether it is really needed, whether it is possible to develop such standards, whether there are enough resources, so expertise, but also if there is enough people to develop the standard, uh, if uh, there are, if there is a need of financial resources, it is important as well to consider national legislation, and it is important to ensure that 
that standard, that proposal, uh, falls within the scope of the technical committee. It is important to ensure that that proposal does not fall in the scope of other TCs. So it's important to check uh, basically the work program of other technical committees just to ensure that the proposal can go ahead within the structure of that um, of that technical committee. After that, there should be a decision. There should be normally is, is a ballot. I have more information in the next uh, slide. There is a, a ballot to decide uh, whether that project should become a standard or not. And if the vote is positive, this means that the new work item is created. The new work item is basically uh, an identification number of that uh, of that standard in our database. But of course, the standard then will have a, a different reference number. If the TC wishes, instead of going first with the new work item, it is possible to choose the preliminary work item route. So the preliminary, preliminary work item is useful when uh, the technical committee finds um, that they need more time, basically where they find that there is the need to have more time to develop the standard because with the preliminary work item, there are no deadlines for the milestones. The preliminary work item is, has a validity of three years. And after the three years, the technical committee will have to make a decision on normally transforming that preliminary work item into a new work item. On this slide, what you can see are the conditions and the criteria for approving new work items. There are basically two conditions. The first one is that for the creation or adoption of a new work item, the decision shall be done by correspondence via the committee internal balloting, the CIB, which is the tool, as my colleague Thierry explained, is the electronic tool that is used for voting uh, by correspondence. And this decision shall be done during a, a period of two months. This means that you cannot take a TC decision in a meeting to create a new work item, to start working on a new standard. And this is quite logical if you think about it, because if you do it by correspondence, you can reach much more NSBs, because if you do it in a meeting, not all the NSBs are presented. So if you do it by correspondence, you ensure that the information and the proposal is submitted to all NSBs. Then there are two um, as well criteria for accepting uh, the creation of a new work item. The first one, obviously, you need a positive vote. And the vote might be weighted vote or simple majority, depending on the situation where you are. Weighted Positive weighted vote applies if you are approving a new work item to develop a brand new standard or a TS or if it's a revision of a standard or an amendment, but you are changing the scope of your standard. In this case, weighted vote applies. Simple majority uh, positive vote applies when you are talking about revisions or amend amendments, but you are not changing the scope. In this case, the weighted vote is not needed and simple majority apply. So this was criterion number one. You need a positive vote, which could be weighted vote or simple majority, as I just explained, depending where you are. The second criterion is that you need at least five members willing to actively participate in the work. So this is important. So if one of these two conditions are not met, in theory, this means that the work item is not approved. Now, for the five members, uh, commitment that is a very important uh, BT decision about the, 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 de the derogation of the five members rule. So if at the end of the ballot for the creation of a new work item, you have a positive vote, but you have less than five members, the technical committee can take a TC decision with a justification to request the technical board for the creation of this work item, even though you do not have the five members rule. So. This is something that you need to have in mind. Uh, preliminary work items. My suggestion to you is that always launch a CIB, also for the creation of uh, a preliminary work item, following the same rules as for the creation of a new work item, two months by correspondence using the CIB. If you wish, the rules are allowed that. If you wish, you can create preliminary work items 
in a meeting, as long as you announce this decision to create a preliminary work item two months before the meeting takes place, you need to indicate that in on the agenda of your meeting, and you need to circulate also two months before the meeting takes place, the new work item form uh, completed for this preliminary work item also circulated two months before the meeting. But I think it's safer if you do it by correspondence, but so that you know the possibility to do it at meetings is there. But you need to comply, of course, with those conditions. The new work item form is mandatory. I have here a print screen. You can uh, download it from uh, the SEN uh, BOSS uh, website. Basically, uh, you need to be very specific in this new work item form. From my experience, the new work item form is being completed by the working group convener. Uh, so it is very important to, precise, to, to provide very precise information. So if you are intending to adopt a new work item or adopt a prelim preliminary work item, you need to indicate if you are developing a standard, a DS, a DR, uh, if it's a new project or if it's a revision. If it's a revision, you need to indicate the superseding, uh, the superseded standards. Um, you need to indicate as well in case this project will, this standard will support EU legislation, you need to indicate which is the EU legislation applicable, what is the standardization request, uh, the deadlines to submit the document to inquiry and formal vote, all this needs to be very well detained, detailed in the new work item form. The working group convener, as I said, is responsible for this, but of course with the support of the experts of the working group. So this is a, a, a joint work in the working group. Once the decision uh, is taken, so after these two months by correspondence, if the new work item is approved, what it needs to be done is that the TC secretary takes the information from this new work item form, goes to Projects Online Working Area, and registers this information in Projects Online Working Area. And the decision then will be, or the information will appear in project on Projects Online. So this is mandatory that you need to register. So it's the TC secretaries that needs to register the new work item on Projects Online working area the information will be there if i'm not mistaken is not immediately and it takes one day uh, for the information to be available so it means that ccmc do not have to register um the the work item in the database in the database so once the work item is created remember that standstill applies standstill means that at national level nsb so the send members cannot initiate uh, any uh, or continue any development of a national standard or other deliverable that will conflict with the project that was just approved at European level for to become a standard. So this is, a, yeah. How is this ensured? Uh, so CCMC will not police the members, of course. If it happens that one NSB or someone from a TC will notice that there is a project ongoing at national level that conflict with this European, uh, let's say, project being developed in a TC, what we would do is that we would just alert the technical board member of that specific uh, country and saying, look, we were alerted that this project under the, that is under development at national level may conflict with these standards. So that's the only thing we would do. It's up to our members to basically take responsibility in stopping anything that would conflict with European project. So, as I said, the working groups are responsible for drafting the standards. Um, when the working group convener together with the working group experts consider that the consensus has been reached and that they are ready to submit the document to CCMC, before that, they need to ensure that the document is aligned with the internal regulations part three which is the Bible, by the way, for drafting standards and for the structuring of standards. Then if everything is aligned, the working group convener or the working group secretary, if there is one, it's not mandatory, but working groups may have uh, a secretary, will submit the document to the TC secretary. TC secretary should also do a check to see if the document is aligned with the internal regulations part three. And if yes, then the TC secretary will submit the document to CCMC via the submission 
tool that we call the submission interface. So there are in the submission interface, we have provided uh, the training on this tool uh, on the 16th of November. So I will not uh, elaborate too much, but there are a lot of requirements that you need to uh, ensure that uh, you deliver when you are submitting the document to CCMC. I give an example, the figures that you include in your standard need to have the right format. Um, the, the the formulas need to be followed by using the, the a specific tool. So all these, the submission interface uh, and also then CCMC will take a look to ensure that you provide uh, the right format uh, with the figures and the tools as well and, and certain other aspects. So we receive the document from your site via the submission interface tool. What my colleague will do, will do a simple check because the first check is already done by the submission interface. And then there is another check done by my colleague. And then she will allocate the document to a CCMC editor. And the editor will have five weeks to edit the standard. By the way, European standards are developed. So the official language of SEN, SENELEC is English, French, and German. Normally, normally the standards are drafted in English. From my experience, it is possible to draft a document in other languages, like in German or French. From my experience, I never seen this. So normally documents are written in English, at least in six years I've been here. Most of the times I see documents uh, drafted in English. One time there was a standard on vocabulary where this standard was a three column table in three languages. So that's what I've seen. But normally the documents are uh, drafted in English. Why am I saying this? Because after the editing period, CCMC will submit the document to our French member and German member, Afnor and Din, so they can translate the document into French and German. And the period for translation is eight weeks. After the eight weeks, we start the public inquiry. So the document is submitted to our members. So the members will discuss the standard at national level, I guess, in the mirror committees. Uh, they may provide editorial, technical, or general comments. Uh, and they have 12 weeks, basically, to provide such a comment and to cast the vote. After the 12 weeks, we have a tool that will collate all the comments. We'll calculate, you submit the voting results, a member submit the voting results, it will calculate the voting results, of course. And then CCMC will dispatch within one day, will dispatch the comments and the voting results to the TC secretary. And then, of course, is a responsibility of the TC secretary to circulate the comments and the voting results to the TC. So this is important. Great yeah. Can you explain what's, what's the so basically, we, we, we ensure that the document is aligned with the internal regulations part three. There could be inconsistencies in terms of shoulds and shalls. I give an example. You cannot have requirements or recommendation in notes. So if this happens, we will uh, make proposals for improvement to the TC to align with IR3. Uh, in terms of normative references, if we see something dated, in a clause uh, of the standard, it's likely that you need to date as well in clause two. So formatting, if we see the document, uh, for example, if you didn't use the templates for drafting standards, we might suggest to change things so you align uh, with the template. So we will not interfere with the technical content, but there are some editorial, mostly editorial um, edition from our side, basically. Are you returning the word document back so basically, we have a, a BT decision that says that resubmissions are not possible. So as soon as you submit to us one time. After the inquiry. After the inquiry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So after the inquiry, we basically, the document is, is, back, uh, is back to you. We don't, after the inquiry, we have edited before, so we don't edit at that stage. The document is back to you. We send you the table of comments. Uh, the voting results, and then I will explain in the next slide. Um, basically, what happens uh, is, so I will continue here. Basically, what happens is that it is the, responsible, uh, the responsibility of the technical committee to discuss the comments received. Most of the time, what happens is that the TC allocates this task to a working group. And then the working group, most of the times, will organize a comments resolution meeting. 
And it is a responsibility also of the working group to go comment by comment and review the whole document received with the comment. It does not mean that each comment needs to be addressed in the standard, but it means that if you receive a thousand comments, you need to go through a thousand times for each comment a thousand times. So this is something that you need to do. Uh, and then, of course, the working group will respond in case some um, comments were not do not need to be included. Or normally, what I see in the in the column uh, comments from the secretariat, normally you see accepted, not accepted, part, partly accepted, uh, not accepted because of some reasons. So normally, this this exercise is done by the working group. This is a stage handling of comments or consideration of comments. After which, basically, when the working group is uh, happy with the work done and consensus has been built, basically the document is again submitted to CCMC for the formal vote. This is the most common path that you can see here on the right side. On the left side, it explains the procedure for skipping the formal vote. On some occasions, it is possible to skip formal vote. There are two conditions. The first condition is that obviously you need a positive vote. That's the first condition. The second condition is that technical comments cannot be taken on board if you want to skip the formal vote. Uh, in case, and we will discuss this in the afternoon, in case of harmonized standards, you also need a positive assessment by the HAS consultant to skip the formal vote. And if a technical committee wants to skip the formal vote, the TC needs to take a TC decision, which is a simple majority decision. Once this is done, then the document is go straight away to the finalization or publication stage without the need, of course, to have a formal vote. So um, most of the times, as I said, the formal votes are not skipped because most of the times there are technical comments coming at inquiry. So mo the most common pass, I would say, is the one that you can see on the right side. So you mean that I'm not allowed to have technical comments and they will set the adopted by the working group or whatever. So, so let's assume you get technical comments, but they are rejected, all of them. Then I can also skip. Correct. Oh, okay. oh, correct. You could skip the formal vote if you do not. We, if, you, if you receive technical comments, but the TC agrees not to take them on board, it is possible to skip the formal vote. But you need to ensure that yeah, sure. You know, we could, there is a danger if you skip some comments that were rejected that the formal vote could be uh, that there could be some issues, but normally it's fine. Yeah, sorry, comment there. No, not, not at all. So if you have editorial comments, what we will do is that you, you follow what I just explained. You take a TC decision uh, to skip the formal vote, and then CCMC will take on board, will edit the document to take on board those editorial comments. And then the document will proceed to publication. So the skipping formal vote is a, a very interesting tool in order to have the standard published in a quick way. Most of the times is not possible because uh, we see that there are often comments coming from the inquiry. So, but if it's possible for you, you should apply this because then you have your standard published much uh, quicker. Yes, please. So you can uh, you can decide either in a meeting or by correspondence. So, in general, maybe I should have included in the in the slides, but in general, the decisions by correspondence should be four months, uh, four weeks. Sorry. <laughs> Four months, four weeks, uh, yeah, four weeks. Uh, but you can also decide in a meeting to take a decision to skip the formal vote. It's always advisable that um, you announce this decision in a meeting prior, I mean, well in advance. So the members of the TC will be prepared for taking the decision at the meeting. So not to make a spontaneous um, discussion in, in the meeting and give the opportunity for the members to discuss this at national level. Okay. Okay. So formal vote stage. So here the process is very similar uh, as the inquiry. So you submit the document to us. We will uh, via submission interface. We will allocate the document to an editor. 
the editor will uh, have five weeks to edit uh, the standard. After the editing, we will request the translation uh, to our French and German member. This translation now, it's five weeks. Remember, the translation before inquiry was eight weeks. <coughs> now it's five weeks, which is logical because the document was already translated one time. So obviously the members need less time to translate the document. After this five weeks translation before the formal vote, then uh, we launch the formal vote uh, stage, which is eight weeks. So uh, the members similarly to the inquiry will have the opportunity to uh, discuss the document, normally in the, in the national committees, and then cast uh, the vote within these eight weeks. Uh, it is important to note that the inquiry and the formal votes are, a wait, are always weighted vote, which is 50% of the votes in favor, plus 65% of the votes uh, must be uh, positive. And the weighted vote, basically, it's uh, it's it's a um, calculation of the GDP and uh, the population of the country. And if you, this comes from also the internal regulations part two. If you look at the annex D2 of the internal regulations part two, you can see uh, the weights that, the, the voting weights that each member, each send member has. Could you say a few words about the membership fight? So we have so the the blue members are um, normally the member states uh, of the European Union. The red members are the ones EFTA plus uh, Turkey, if I'm not mistaken, and the yellow member is uh, for the time being we only have uh, UK. So with the Brexit, we had to reformulate our status. We were not prepared for Brexit in our bylaws. So we had to restructure uh, the membership in order to, uh, because there is no agreement yet between the Commission and UK, so we had to restructure our membership and separate uh, the membership according to the agreements with the EU, basically. Uh, so this also means that in case of a standardization request or harmonized standards, in case there is a, a negative vote, uh, we will have a double counting mechanism and we will remove the countries that are uh, not uh, blue members. Alberto, is everything okay? Alberto is the expert in this, so I was just checking if everything is fine. Okay. So there is one very important rule after the formal vote stage when we are finalizing the standard. This is probably the longest BT decision that I have seen. After the formal vote, the golden rule is that technical comments are not allowed. This BT decision indicates that only editorial, obvious editorial errors can be taken into account after the formal vote stage. The BT decision explains as well what is an obvious editorial error, which is an editorial error that is recognized immediately and without any doubt, both by the CCMC editor and the TC secretary. So this is a bit of decision that is important also to avoid long discussions between the TC secretary and um, CCMC. We understand that sometimes there are editing errors from your point of view when you are managing the document, copy paste, and while editing the document, we understand that could be errors, but if those errors have technical impact in the standard, they are not considered um, editorial errors. If it happens after the formal vote, that you receive many comments that are very important, technical and very important, there is or there are exceptionally two possibilities to take on board those technical comments via the technical board. Again, exceptionally. The first one is if you receive many, many, many technical comments after the formal vote, and if you consider that you need to take those on board to prevent the incorrect application of the standard, you can request the technical board, you need a justification for a second formal vote. So Thierry at the beginning of uh, the presentation gave you an example on that. If after the formal vote, you see very limited technical comments that need to be integrated in the standard, otherwise you're gonna have incorrect standard, there is another uh, procedure which is um, 
a procedure for the limited technical changes after the formal vote and prior to publication. It's a bit more bureaucratic because the member, the BT member holding the secretariat of that PC needs to make the request to CCMC and the BT chair, and then we submit that to the technical board. But it allows that you make the changes without the need to have a second formal vote, just with a BT decision. But those need to be very limited, okay? After the formal vote, we will edit the standard. This editing takes two weeks, and we will submit the standard to uh, the technical committee for the TC proofing. The TC proofing basically is a final validation by the technical committee. We need the green light from your side to say, okay, the document can be uh, published. Normally the TC proofing is two weeks. If you need, you can request one additional week. So it can be three weeks. And there is a recent BT decision that during holiday, so in the summer or in Christmas, you can have four weeks TC proofing. Do you provide a red one document that everybody can see what the editor has changed compared to what you have submitted? We, from my knowledge, this is the editor doing the job. From my knowledge, we provide the table of comments where we explain what was accepted and what was not accepted. And we provide, to my experience, the clean version. I don't mean the comments. I mean, the, you say you have this five weeks of editor who's going through the document and check it. Two weeks. According yeah. to the regulations in, in inquiry, for example. And um, I would like to see what has been changed. So this is something, so in each phase of editing, we don't bounce the document back to the TC, interact changes to show what has been done. Because in principle, in principle, I, I know sometimes it's not the case, but in principle should only be editorial. Well. I understand the comment, sense. but from my experience, we, we don't share the document interact changes, but I know that the request is not new. I, I know uh, some some TCs have requested if this is possible. According to the current process, is not, but this is something that if it's of that we could rediscuss in the future. But this is the rule for the time being. But is it possible that because the editor doesn't really understand the subject, if I have changed that which then becomes wrong? Yeah, exactly. Why don't you change it back again and then you do it back again? And so it's hard to understand sometimes. Maybe it be changed because of what? Maybe in other words, what was the IDTC proofing? It's access to the document. So, so the TC proofing is submitted to the TC secretary. The TC secretary can then contact the working group convener. Normally, this is what happens contact the working group convener to check that the editing was, I mean, that the document can go to publication. This is a stage where there could be disagreements. I'm honest with you. There could be disagreements on what is a technical change and what is an editorial change. And I understand, Nigel, uh, your point. I do, but um, normally the editing should, I mean, the editor should just change editorial uh, comments. So, yeah. I, I see in standards, well, I, I think there are only um, drafts where, yes, they've been written in English, but it's the devil's own job to understand them. Now, an English person, if you, you, you read it, you think, well, I understand what each individual word means, but when I read the whole thing, I have a clue. So the editor's job, I take it, is to make that clear turn that text into something that makes sense. We will not make substantial editorial changes normally, unless I give an example. If you draft a clause that does not respect the neutrality principle, you may sometimes do that. The IR3 do not allow that. So this is the only case where the editor normally with in collaboration with the the CCMC uh, pro uh, project manager could make a proposal to the technical committee to restructure the phrase. But normally, we don't change too much the structure of the sentences. We may change, as I said earlier, we may change, for example, if you make requirements uh, in the scope, if you make requirements in, the, in notes. This is the kind of, um, um, let's say, things we would spot and we would change. Changing, I understand that sometimes changing it should 
with a shawl have a technical impact. But if you make uh, a shawl and you don't include the clause in the, 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 if you have a normative reference, you don't include the clause in the in clause two, we may alert you for these kind of things. But normally we shouldn't change much the structure of the sentence. But I I get your point, and um, well, we have the rules as they are now, and maybe in the future something can be changed. But normally we try to limit our check to basic editorial uh, aspects. Okay. Yeah. Well, if it's after the formal vote, if the error was because of CCMC, we can make that change. So that's something that, okay, we take the blame, we messed up, it happens. And in that case, we will allow the change. During the editing, often you could also contact the, the name of the editor is on projects online. So if you have questions, you can contact directly the editor. Sometimes the editor will contact you as well uh, when in case of uh, in case of questions or just to validate something. And I'm talking about the, 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 the editing before the inquiry or editing before the formal vote, we might come back to you to ensure that certain elements um, should be corrected and if you agree with certain changes. So it's a work that requires a lot of cooperation and it is done. It is done. Okay. Can I please ask for future questions to turn on the microphone? It's not that important. We can hear you, but we're recording this, so it will be shared with any TPO afterwards so they have the full package of information. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I put here some examples of what is a technical comment, what is an editorial comment. So in the example one, I have two uh, two sub examples. Let's put it this way. So the member, this is after um, the formal vote. So the member provided this comment saying that is editorial, asking to change the diameter from one hundred fifty plus minus five to one hundred fifty plus minus. 15 millimeters. Of course, this is a technical change. It's not editorial. If you look at the example, still uh, example one in the in the second row, um, it is proposed as well, again, editorial to change for pipes greater than 630 millimeters diameter to greater or equal than 630 millimeters. So of the diameter. So mathematically, this is different. So we cannot take those comments on, on board. We do understand that from your perspective, it could have been something you forgot to see, a copy paste from a different uh, document. We understand, but this kind of comments cannot be taken on board. Example two, you can see uh, two sub examples of what is allowed in terms of uh, editorial comments after the formal vote. For example, to correct typos. So the first example, we clearly understand that the word test should be there, but you can see that the word was incomplete. So this is the kind of um, this is the kind of uh, comments that we can take on board. And below, uh, there was an editorial comment in a table where the values and the units were not in correct line. So of course we can help uh, to fix the document in order to have everything um, in line. So this is for more formatting and these kind of things we can uh, accept. Uh, for for the piece for the uh, for the corrections, uh, why must we always wait when you bring something in for the formal vote that you are going to look at it and help uh, and change something? Maybe it's also possible that we can do it before. So uh, and then of course you can check afterwards, but that will be a session before that you can simply send it and and somebody read it already, change the, the things they want to change, and then. Because then you do a lot help easier. Why is that not possible? I can see that the room is in accordance, is is in agreement basically with this uh, with this validation. So the rule is that uh, there are many checks by the editor and the exchanges that, as I explained between the editor and the TC if needed. This is the sort of thing that. Um, we would uh, we would uh, check before the inquiry and before the formal vote while editing. There will be exchanges with the TCs, with the TC secretaries. Normally, as I said, 
and align with the with the comments provided earlier. We do not have a stage after editing that we submit the document uh, to um, to the TCs for a, a validation. So this does not exist today. These are the rules that were defined by our technical boards. The only thing I can say is that, okay, if you wish this rule to be in place, you can contact your NSP and make these proposals and then uh, the member can bring this uh, idea um, to a specific uh, working group of the technical boards to allow this to be ha to be to to happen. I yeah, I hope that works. Uh, I am already sixteen years working in working groups and and things, and I in the sixty years I see a lot of drama. <laughs> and what you explain now, most of the time will not happen at the time because when you bring a standard at that moment, there's a lot of corrections. But we had, if we have heard, heard it earlier, we could easier change it. And I think some basic thing is could be helpful. But okay. No, no worries. No, I do understand the comments. Uh, of course, this can happen, and uh, I understand. That's why there are also solutions in case of technical comments after the formal vote. There is still the possibility via the technical board to make these changes to allow that the standard then is not uh, published with those errors. The process is what it is. It was agreed by our SAN BT members. But as I said, uh, maybe in the future this could change and you would be invited then to contact your NSB to make this proposal for changing the rules. And then the member, if the member agrees, could bring this idea to be discussed with the other BT members. So I need to speed up probably because uh, we have uh, half an hour left. Um, so CCMC will finalize the document and we will distribute, we will make the doc, we will edit and then we'll make the document available to uh, send members for a national publication. Our members have the obligation as soon as a standard is published or made available, has the obligation to withdraw national conflicting standards So and publish as a national standard. So this means that one standard published by uh, a, well, made available, developed by a technical committee will be the same in 34 countries. So this is really the power of European standards. And again, standards are developed in English, French, and German. And of course, the other SEN members can also translate if they wish. They can translate uh, the document into their national language. We have amendments and we have core agenda. Amendments are possible uh, to make specific uh, modifications or deletions or additions to the standard. And only if a, an amendment is produced, only the amendment is voted. There is a very important rule about amendments uh, and about the production of amendments. Amendments are only possible for standards that are not older than four years. If the standard is older than four years and you will need to make changes in the document, then you need to produce uh, a revision. For amendments, you still need to follow the normal approval process. You need a new work item ballot by correspondence, two months, and then the normal inquiry plus formal vote process uh, applies. For core agenda, the situation is a little bit different. Core agenda do not have a vote, so we need to be extremely careful with, um, let's say, producing core agendas. Corrigendas normally are used to correct uh, mistakes that can lead to the unsafe use of the standard and that somehow were missing during the formal vote or publication. Uh, and what you need to do is to make a request to CCMC production team. We will, of course, uh, take a look, assess, and then the document is uh, is published. So ideally, it would be better not to go with Corrigenda if they do not lead to the unsafe use of the standard. So if there are some technical errors that do not lead to the unsafe use of the standard, then we will invite you to produce an amendment or a revision of the standard. So to, to go back to the case earlier, where we were talking about a high parameter, mm -hmm. which is a if you want to correct that, which of these should be different? I mean, if the standard is, okay, there are, Two possibilities. One possibility would be to apply, if the standard is not published yet, one possibility would be to apply this BT decision for limited technical changes. Go to the BT, the BT approves, 
the document is changed and then it's published. That's possibility number one. Uh, you could, if the standard is less than four years old, you could produce an amendment if in that particular case of the diameter of the pipes. Okay. Uh, of course, if there are other issues, the technical committee could also initiate a revision if they wish. That's also possible. Now, talking about maintenance and systematic review, the standards are published uh, for a period, then the validity, let's say, is of five years, after which we launch a systematic review, which is a consultation of the standard that is launched to the SEN members, that they need to decide, uh, well, they need to, to vote whether um, the, the standard should be confirmed, the standard should be withdrawn, or if the standard should be revised. So this is just a consultation. It takes five months. After the systematic review closes, the TC will always have to follow up that with a TC decision. So if it's for a confirmation, they need to take a TC decision, whether in a meeting or by correspondence. Uh, if it's to withdraw the standard, the TC needs to take a decision, and then it needs to go to the technical board. If it's a revision, basically, the technical committee do not need to take a TC decision. Let's decide to uh, revise the standard. You can, but it's not needed. What you need to do is launch a ballot for approving a new work item to revise the standard. Two months consultation, and then the document, if approved, you can initiate the revision. Yes, please. For revision are necessary five states or or not, or in case of, I don't know, it's missing some some tables on, on the standards, maybe you want to fill up or make more specific, or there are other, other way of obtaining, please. Thank you. So for the revision, you also need a five members rule. So you still need five members committed to participate. So if it's not possible, then there is the possibility of the derogation of the five members rule to the technical board. Um, can you prepone or postpone the systematic review? It's not possible to postpone. It is possible to anticipate. So if you want to launch earlier, this is possible. You need to inform us. We can launch earlier, but it's not possible to postpone. Uh, I mean, technically it's possible, but we shouldn't be doing this because the documents are uh, valid for a period of five years, after which they need to be reviewed. So they need to be assessed what to do next with the standards. OK. Uh, for information, we have the Flexible Standards Development Process, which was approved in 2019. It applies to send homegrown European standards, so standards developed only by the technical committees, or work items under the Vienna Agreement with send lead. So if the document is developed by a CNTC together with ISO, with ISO lead, this flexible standard development process is not applicable. I've included here on the slide a number of uh, links and uh, that you can follow with recording and, and uh, uh, training material on what is exactly the flexible standard development process. Before, this, is, this slide that you have here is more or less what I explained to you earlier. Before, the flexible standard development process, uh, our way of developing standards was rigid. So stage A here is the stage for DCs to draft a standard at the beginning of the process. And stage E, after the inquiry, inquiry stage D. After the inquiry, the handling of comments, the TC also has the time to draft the document. So the time frame for stage A and for stage E, your time to draft the document was split equally into 34, 34 weeks, 68 in total. So this was before 2019, before the flexible standard development process. With the flexible approach, the internal processes and the votes are exactly the same. You still have stage A plus stage E is still 68 weeks, but you choose how much time you want for stage A and how much time you want for stage E. So basically, since you are the ones developing the standards, to have a more project, ma project management point of view, since you manage your project, you should decide how much time you want to allocate for stage A and for stage E. There are three rules. The first rule is that 
A plus E is 68 weeks. I already told you that. The second rule is that stage A must have a minimum of one week, and stage E must, must have a minimum of six weeks. So these are the three rules. Uh, and after that, you can apply uh, the time that is convenient and applicable for you. So this means that stage one, uh, sorry, stage A could be one week, and stage E could be 67 weeks if you like. So this is up to you uh, to decide. And I will not go through um, the diagram, but basically I have explained you this in the slides before. In gray, you have editing and translation. In orange or salmon, I don't know which color is this, is the inquiry and the formal vote. And uh, basically the dark blue is the stage for you to draft the standard. So the time frames are on top. I have explained you this, so I don't think we need to go through that now. These are the three conditions that I explained to you. 68 weeks in total, dispatch to the inquiry is one week, dispatch to formal work must have a minimum of six weeks. So this was explained. And for the first working draft uh, dispatch, this is half of the time to dispatch the document to the inquiry. So what you need to do in practice is that in your working group, when you are completing the new work item form, there is a section 19 where you need to indicate what is the date to submit the document to CCMC for inquiry and for formal vote. So these dates need to be discussed by the convener with the working groups. So this is quite important. The document, the new work item form, when the CIB is launched, will need to be attached to the CIB, two months ballot, you may remember. And once it is completed, the TC secretary what you can see here is an extract of projects online working area. There are two editable fields and the TC secretary will need to insert the dates that were in the new work item form in the stage code 3099, dispatch of the document to inquiry and 4599, dispatch of the formal vote draft to CCMC. If you make a mistake, the system will not allow for you to create the work item. Imagine, for the stage A, you give less than uh, one week, or in total, you give more than 68 weeks, the system will not allow, and then you need to rethink about the deadlines and provide the correct deadlines in um, in Project Online Working Area. Have a comment? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, 68 weeks sounds like a long time, but having sat on a number of committees, it isn't. So presumably that's where the pre-new work item comes in. So you would raise a pre-work item first, do a lot of the work until you've reached the point where you think you can complete it in a re reasonable time, and then you convert it into a new work item. Is that is that right? That's option one. Yeah. Option two, you go with a new work item, you are running out of time, and you can do two things. Either you take a TC decision for a tolerance of 39 weeks, so you gain extra 39 weeks, or you apply, and this is what we recommend you to do first, you apply the one change option. For the tolerance, you need a TC decision, simple majority, 39 weeks, which is a bullet point below. For the one change option, you do not need a TC decision. You just need an agreement between the TC leadership in cooperation with the working group convener. What does it mean, the one change option? It means that, so we are back to the flex diagram. It means that you still, you still time from stage E and you add it to stage A. You don't gain more time, but you take time from ahead and you bring it back to stage A. The advice is for you to start with this. If this is not a good solution for you, you go with a TC decision for tolerance. Or, as you explained, Nigel, you can always go with a preliminary work item, work, and then when you are sure that you can meet the deadlines, you activate the preliminary work item into a work item, and then you start working with the specific deadlines. Okay, and now is my colleague Thierry to continue and finalize. <coughs> So, as mentioned by uh, Nuno, he was focusing a lot on 
uh, ENs on European standard, and I will have the duty to uh, speak a bit, uh, but not so, such so much uh, in details about TS, technical specification, uh, TR, technical report, and CWA. TS and TR are documents which are usually uh, developed by a technical committee. <clears throat> The technical specification is a document on, upon which there is not so much certainty uh, on the content, something which is a, a new product, or it can be uh, an IT project where you need to produce a document very fast. A TS is a document which is not obtaining standstill. It means that uh, a national committee can still publish a national standard in conflict with a TS. So you understand that the TS has less robustness in terms of, uh, let's say, applicability to, to the sector and particularly uh, possibility to support European legislation, but it has the advantage <clears throat> to go very fast. So as described in this uh, uh, flow chart, uh, you have, uh, in this case of a TS, you do not have an inquiry. So you develop the document, you have a time frame. Usually it is uh, 12, 12 months or 52 weeks. Um, you may, but it's not obligatory, uh, provide uh, an interim document, a third document, to show that you have progress in the development of this document. Otherwise, uh, when you are ready, you will go simply, it's like you, you go directly to the formal vote. So you, you, have, you, you send a document to CCMC, CCMC will uh, edit the document, and there, are, there is eight weeks of translation because TS, uh, are um, translated in German and French as well. And then again, it will be a kind of formal vote, vote in, green, in green, 12 weeks, where you, you will uh, apply the, 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 the process and vote upon the document. And then again, we will prepare the the, the definitive text it is done by CCMC. We will uh, adjust with the uh, editorial uh, mistakes. We will then ask for a blessing of the translation and and publish the make available the definitive text for uh, uh, publication by the members. And Thierry, yes, I remember that there was at least for TS and also for TR as stage possible, an optional stage is what's called TC comment ballot. Is it still available or in this in this 30 year if, area? If you wish to, to get a ballot before law, oh, yeah, I guess it's... Okay, you, you did not. I'm yes, sorry. we are both speaking in parallel, it's fine. Um, so I got the question, we, 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 it was an, an recorded. Um, if you want to prepare yourself to be sure that the document will be approve without too many technical comments, what you can do, you can do a technical committee ballot. It is uh, the only solution to, to, uh, to mitigate the risk to get many comments at the level of the TS uh, vote, the formal vote on the TS. It is uh, the best approach to, to, uh, to eliminate a maximum of, of, of mistakes in, in the document. You can and, and, and it is similar in a TR. If you wish to, to get uh, the document without too many comments during the vote, you can do that as well. So for the TR, it is very similar, except that there are no, let's say, time needed for a translation because the TR is only issued in one language, which is usually English. Uh, and so the, the basic framework is, is the same, the same time for vote. There is no inquiry, except if you do an inquiry within the TC, but it's not an official inquiry. So basically, this is the, let's say, the, the flow, uh, the time flow of the, for the development of a TR. A TR, it's, it's used uh, normally to, can be used 
for a broad number of uh, of reasons. Usually, it is to to report informatively about a topic or state of the art. It can be also uh, a document to um, let's say prepare some some future work. It can be also uh, an analysis of uh, a problematic existing in the sector. So there are a lot of possibility uh, for occasion to develop it here. Another, another uh, way which is used quite often is to uh, develop it here to explain how you develop an EN, what are the, the reasons you took this and these options. So plenty of possibility. No. Workshop agreement in one slide is a big, big, big challenge, but I will try to do it. So a workshop agreement is a document which is developed contrary to what we were speaking before. Uh, it's not developed within a TC and a working group. It is developed within a totally new and dedicated structure, which is called a workshop. So what happens when you develop a, a workshop? There is a, a business, can be an industry. It happens very often that there are research and development projects which are wishing to get some deliverable in the public domain and, and have some recognition. So they will come to us and, and come with a, a business plan saying we would like to develop within usually very short period, similar to a TS, would like to develop a document within one or Eight, one year or 18 months. So the, the, the project developed what you call a business plan is a kind of a char, chart where we they describe what is the purpose of developing the document, the time frame, who will be the, the, the sponsor of this document, uh, which secretary they want to, to use. Usually they will take uh, one of the NSB as a secretariat. And there is in within a workshop, there is no national delegation. It's only uh, an audience, uh, a list of stakeholders which will uh, decide to participate and contribute in the development of the document. Usually, the main sponsor comes with an initial proposal, and then all the other uh, colleagues comments on the document. There may be one or two or three uh, rounds of comments, and the document is improved, improved, improved. And at a, a certain stage, uh, the document will be, um, let's say, circulated to a kind of public inquiry, but it is only a consultation. It is put on the website, and the other members not participating in the, in the workshop can make comment as well. And again, then the comments will be taken on board or not by the workshop. And finally, it will uh, allow uh, for a publication of what we call a SEN workshop agreement. Um, what I did not mention and which is on the slide is that uh, a workshop is also open to non-European uh, members. So it is possible to have non-European members. And uh, let's say the, the, the stakeholders of the workshop are the people who have registered to the workshop and who will contribute to the workshop. Usually, uh, it is a case of fun for a research project. The, there is a budget coming from the research project, but it can happen also that... Uh, some business, some sponsor, come with a, a budget and, and try to complement the, the support of this uh, workshop by uh, asking for a fee for all the members who will participate. So there are a lot of flexibility. The documents, we try to use the template in order to have a document quite close to uh, an European standard TS or TR, but it is a little bit software uh, and what is important uh, the triangle there is maximum lifetime of six years it means that after three years we will ask 
the, the workshop sponsor to confirm if he wants to, to keep the document for an additional three years. At that time, he can decide to do something, uh, which can be, which I will explain before, after. And then after six years, there is a need absolutely to decide to, to do something about the workshop. It can be withdrawn, like any document of Sen Senec, but one of the, the possibility is also to transform the, the CWA into a TS or an EM. So it is good at that time that the, the sponsor of the workshop um, can find and liaise with an existing technical committee and try to transform the content of the CWA into a work item and into a, a future EN, knowing that, of course, in this case, we have already a first document, so uh, the development time until inquiry will be a little bit uh, more easy. Ah, oh, sorry, I did not. TR. Sorry. Yeah. It could, in theory, uh, be transposed into a tier, but a, a CWA is more of, let's say, the nature is more uh, a TS. It's more similar to a TS. It's a document which is not yet, which there is not yet a, a big consensus where we need to go fast. And it's it's already some, some document which contains some normative elements, which that's why it's not very logic to transform a CWA into a TR. It, the, the, the golden gate is to go to an EN because then it is really going to a, a, a more uh, sophisticated uh, document with much more recognition. Yeah. Um, so this is the, the basic. yes yes yeah thank you uh, if I understand it correctly the workshop agreement can be a standalone project uh, so who holds the secretariat for those workshop agreements or does, does, does it differ maybe I, I've been going fast because I was only one slide there is a sponsor sponsor can be a manufacturer can be an association and and this association decide for an NSB to, to hold the secretariat. So can decide because he is based in Belgium. He will go to the Belgian member to get an host. But maybe it is a consortium where you have, I don't know, Romanian, Belgian, uh, Danish. And then they will decide, are we going to Romania, to Belgium? To... They will have to take a decision and choose one NSB and then ask this NSB if they wish to, to offer this service. And then they, they decide, but they come to CCMC with a business plan, with a project, with a plan. And then of course, I will not explain the detail. I don't know if there is a session on CWA in the, in the training to, uh, two days, but it can be the subject of a, a full webinar. The, the business plan is accepted. And of course, the, the secretariat will we support the development of the document with the expertise of the secretary, while the sponsor usually will, will chair the, the evolution and the exchange of the technical document. But a lot of the exchange, because it is a, a modern tool which needs to go very fast, is done uh, via a, a website, uh, a platform. It's not much physical meeting, maybe one at the beginning, and one at the end to, to confirm the finalization of the, of the work. So, very quickly, but it's very informative. No, those, those next slides are more uh, to show you where you can find a lot of information. And you probably know already, it was already quoted by Nuno, there is what we call a boss, a send boss, and there is also a send elect boss, where you can find all the information related to internal rules. There are a set of formatted decisions. There are forms and templates, and also uh, a, a lot of tools, elements, and you can Google and find some 
reply to specific question. This is really a tool for you. There's a list of the forms and templates on the on the left and on the right, you have a calculator to calculate what is the percentage. Uh, you can simulate what is the percentage of, uh, of, uh, of support of your document. Um, so this is the type of, of information that you will find in the boss. There are some explanation on how to, uh, to, uh, to address a, a topic and often it is supported by a formatted decision. So if, for example, here you are wishing to confirm an EN, you simply take out of the toolbox the relevant delegated decision, you fill in the, the field in gray, and then you, you have already your decision. You do not need to try to invent a format of a decision. Also next to the, the boss, Usually, and every every six months at least, there is the technical board newsletter, and this is a, an excellent digest for for you to know what happened during the the technical board session. You can have access to the summary of the key decision which were taken there, and of course, if you like to get more detail, you need to address your your uh, your BT member. Um, and this newsletter is addressed to all TC officers, so you can distribute it uh, quite uh, broadly, if necessary. Finally, on this slide, you find uh, a lot of information that we issue um, regularly, send website on different topics like uh, uh, normative reference in harmonized standard, what is the principle of um, um, I don't know, um, ADV, how to use a high deviation, or to develop an harmonized standard in machinery field or whatsoever. There are a lot of webinars that you can um, consult and, and, and video. Um, and there are a lot of material I invite you to, uh, when you get the, the presentation, which I guess will be the case, you can click on the various link which appear on, on, this, uh, on this slide. This slide is important also because it it tries to map where and who you need to address when you have a problem. When you have a problem related to data, to the data contained in the database, you need to address your message to data service. And, and you need certainly to do that each time you have a new TC decision that you need to implement into the database. Or if you have question about trying to create a work item in the database after a, a positive ballot, those are the people that you need to contact. While the second line related to production is a line where uh, you will uh, question when you have problem, when you need to upload the documents for, for example, for inquiry, you have problem with a tool, uh, you are you get your your document rejected because the the figures are not in the right format. So this is where you need to interface when there are questions issues related to a, a specific document that you are wishing to progress. Partners is very specific specific. It is connected to all the uh, liaisons associations which are wishing to get in liaison with your technical committee and you need that they fulfill the basic requirements in order to be eligible for obtaining a liaison uh, with them and if they can get let's say the, the, the green line to be able to get a, a liaison with them then the, the system the partners colleagues will contact the TC secretary there will be a ballot to confirm that uh, there can be a, a, a formal liaison between a TC and an European association candidate to become partner. And this is the, the, the persons who are uh, behind partners. <clears throat> now, if you have issues related to pre-normative pre research, when you need to develop or to try to find some 
funding or some some possible research within a university, then you need to contact uh, research. And of course, and it is not on this list, if you have a generic question, you have always, as you know, in, in the database, there is always a, a contact PM or account manager. Those are the people who are able to guide you on, the, on a daily basis and who will, uh, to, to whom you need to, to get some uh, some exchange if you have a problem that you are not able to resolve with the four address we have mentioned here. So I think we had a lot.